All right, everyone, welcome to our DevOps office hours. It's November 10th, 2021. My name is Eric Osterman, and I'll be leading the conversation. I'm the founder and CEO of CloudPostin. We're a DevOps accelerator, and that means that we help companies own their infrastructure in record time by building it together with your team while showing them the ropes. So if that sounds interesting, head over to cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. For those of you new to the call, the format's very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered. So feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you wanna jump in and participate. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by heading over to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash office hours. We host these calls every week. Our call today is recorded. We'll automatically post a recording of this session to our YouTube channel. So if you enjoy the content and want to support our channel, please hit those like and subscribe buttons. Also, I uh, recommend if you don't uh, have your team on the call uh, today, you might as well share those videos with the team too. It's a great way for them to uh, stay in touch with what we're up to. So with that said, let's go over and uh, review the lengthy number of announcements um, that uh, came out over the past week. So uh, the big one is, of course, I'm sure everyone who is uh, subscribed to HashiCorp updates and Terraform in their news feed saw that HashiCorp has filed their S1, which is their intention to go public. Uh, it's the first insight into HashiCorp as a uh, private company. Uh, so we can kind of see how they're doing financially and um, you know, where the revenue is uh, piled up. So it uh, seems like apparently most of the revenue is coming from uh, services and not necessarily their uh, you know, HashiCorp cloud products, but I'm guessing that's the area of growth that we would expect to see uh, in their cloud products. Um, anybody uh, want to point out any interesting insights uh, into that S1 filing that you got? There was a thread in our Terraform channel as well here uh, when they filed it. Let's see, where was it? Yeah, Yanni uh, highlighted a couple of highlights here. 100% year over year growth of their cloud services. However, they were still low uh, at 4 million last year. All right. Next announcement is, um, oh, also, I mean, I, you know, reading between the lines, uh, you know, in, in seeing this S1 now and then seeing some of the stuff that has been going on, you know, earlier this year with uh, Mitchell Hashimoto stepping down as uh, co-CTO, um, I'm guessing that was in anticipation of this announcement because, you know, they, they want to show stability and they don't want to show departures of key team members from strategic roles uh, as soon as they file this S1. All right, so um, this is kind of an exciting announcement. Now it was a reInvent last year. I think they introduced that they were working on Babelfish. I don't think that it was um, GA at that point. Uh, it has gone GA now, generally available, and it's open source. So you can run the Babelfish proxy essentially in front of your Postgres cluster uh, if you want to um, cut over from uh, Microsoft SQL uh, with less of a headache of uh, re redesigning or re-architecting your applications. The benefit of Babelfish is it speaks the uh, Microsoft SQL wire protocol. So your apps shouldn't need too many changes, if any, uh, to support it. Has anybody already been dabbling with Babelfish? Uh, I looked at it a little bit and it, it's worth noting that um, running a proxy in front of it may be um, overstating what's happening because it's, <laughs> it's literally a checkbox um, that you check when you create your RDS cluster. Um, for Aurora and yeah. it now like just listens on a port. It's not like it's a separate piece of something that you need to deploy in front of an RDS cluster. It's kind of uh, it's kind of built in. And also worth noting is that it doesn't support 100% of the T-SQL language yet. It's still, uh, they're still working on, um, on being able to support more and more things, but they have some like 80-20 support, something like that now. 
Okay, so I think I, yeah, it looks like it's actually an extension to the Postgres core. I thought it was just a proxy. Um, so, and I also just to call out the different, so what Matt's talking about is, yeah, as an a Amazon user, uh, it's just a checkbox. Now, if you wanted to, if you're running on-prem or something, you wanted to have the same capabilities, that's what this is. This is the source code for their extensions to Postgres here, which they're obligated yeah. to. Um, yeah, sorry, I was talking specifically about the AWS one, not the yeah. not the open source Apache one. So that's cool. So yeah, did, did you see a list of, uh, I, I bet they have a published list of limitations, but I haven't taken a look specifically for it. Yeah, I, I saw a mention of it, but I didn't see an actual, like, an actual mm. document that had the, the whole thing yet. Missing so. features here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I'm still scrolling by the way. Uh, so yeah, yeah. there's I a mean, lot of missing functionality. So depending on your, the extent of your usage of uh, T-SQL, your mileage may vary. Yeah. Yeah. Just to be clear though, all those things that you're just going by aren't necessarily missing. They just have notes about some of them like usage. Yeah, a lot of them are not yeah, supported. But a lot of them are not supported, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. And let's see what other announcements here. So, yeah, this was, this, you know, a lot of these um, articles are getting old right now. Yeah, we all know there are supply chain issues. Um, this, what I liked about this article was I saw a little bit of myself in this, uh, you know, being a little older and how I got my start. Um, you know, it's definitely uh, started with Slackware on a hand-me-down PC that I got at some point and didn't know what the heck I was doing with Linux, uh, you know, survived on the uh, BITCHX, which I won't say out loud, client uh, for IRC, and uh, got a lot of um, help out there. Fortunately, it was an RMRF. Now, his point of this article wasn't that he, he had his own Linux box and uh, just randomly typed sudo RMRF after getting the advice on, on IRC. It was rather that the way we do packages and manage packages today is essentially the same thing, uh, because under the hood, the packages have hooks pre-installed scripts, post-installed scripts that can do anything you can do with your current scope of permission. So uh, this is true of NPM, but it's also true of like every package manager out there, whether it's you know, Debian, RPM, Alpine, et cetera. So what I think he makes a good point on uh, in this article is there's, there's getting to be more and more focused on the publishers of open source to prevent these things from happening. And yes, this is a multi-pronged approach. It's you know security in depth. And that has to be one thing. But the bigger problem is why are users using this still not sandboxing? Why are we not, like uh, the, the particular uh, package that was compromised for four hours this past week was um, this UA parser JS, which uh, installed some uh, you know typical crypto mining stuff. It tried to leak uh, your uh, developer credentials and compromise your developer workstation. All right, that's a whammy. But well, if the developers were encouraged or incentivized rather to work underneath a sandbox environment, either in you know vagrants or better yet uh, Docker containers, the blast radius of these kinds of attacks is much much less. Now it wouldn't have prevented say, you know, crypto mining from happening, but the crypto mining wouldn't have been able to uh, have access to anything on your core and it would be within that sandbox from a CPU perspective and everything else. Uh, in the ability for it to compromise the developer's workstation, it would be a much, much, much more complicated attack vector for uh, that uh, script to have to also break out of a Docker jail, if it's even possible, depending on your version of Docker. Um, it's not going to help it, you know, entering into production, but the, you know, we're looking for a multi-pronged approach here. Um, and I think uh, in encouraging developers to do a little bit less local development might be a, a good thing. Local as in native uh, on OS X directly or on Windows directly versus having a container image for it. Yeah, I think, I think the other thing that's interesting about this article was that um, 
it brings to light that sometimes you don't even have any clue that you're using a package because it's a transient dependency. Like, so, mm-hmm. you know, you depend on something that depends on something that depends on it. So yeah. like just that, that package alone, I just went, I was curious and went and looked at it. And there are something like 1250 <laughs> packages that depend on it. And then just imagine how many packages depend on those 1250 yeah, or, you know, whatever yeah. exponential like growth for, so there's probably tens of thousands of packages at, at a minimum um, yeah. that have that in there. So, you know, one bad actor can easily distribute something really quickly like that. Yeah. It goes really quick. And then all the auto update stuff, uh, all the dependent bots and renovate spots, ensuring you get the latest version of the upstream compromised package. Um, and yeah, it just, you know, highlighting the point that, you know, with, uh, with open source, there is no SLA, there, there's very seldom, you know, any kind of, uh, contribution agreements and these are unpaid unsecured vendors and they're in the critical path of everything you do. So let's take a defensive approach to how we tackle this. We're, we're not going to stop using open source. We couldn't write that much original code in projects and maintain it, but let's, yeah, let's, uh. Let's fix it. All right, uh, next announcement. Um, just a small one. I'm not sure how exciting it is. Um, if you are using Grafana, obviously it'd be cool if this was in the Grafana core, but the way it seems like this is uh, uh, written is that this is at least SAS first uh, offering. So uh, Grafana adding incident management capabilities, um, what they're calling on-call here. So. You don't necessarily need to depend on page duty or ops duty. You can leverage just all in one through Grafana. Now, this is the Grafana SaaS, so I don't know how much different it is than from using uh, one of the bona fide you know, traditional systems like page duty or ops duty. Anybody know if this is going to make its way into the uh, open source core, or this is always going to be SaaS? I don't know, but it's worth noting that it does say that it's still beta. So I'm sure they're yeah, they're figuring all that out. Yeah. That goes core, that would be uh, that would need some SaaS backend though, right? Well, it because... would definitely need like a Twilio integration or yeah. Amazon has their uh, voice uh, integrations and SMS integrations. I forget what it's called. Uh, the telephony stuff. So yeah, inevitably it'll need a bridge to the telephony networks if you want to have that level of escalation. Or I mean, the way you know off and pager duty work better today is they're not actually calling and they're not actually paging you. They're using the native uh, notification interfaces with the mobile apps, and I think that's a better experience. Yeah, and they have a mobile app, so yeah, it might be. But Grafana would be able to have, um, but have I, that too. I bet, I bet they won't do that because they were struggling with profits for yeah. a lot of time. So. Uh, Grafana, was that one of the pro- projects that also uh, jumped ship on the Apache 2 license to something else or from LIT to something else? Oh, uh, I don't think they were suffering from this. Let's see what their current license is. Cloud arrivals. Yeah, AGPL on April 20th. Relicense, yeah. So they were uh, a Faro uh, yeah. GPL. So. Um, this was, uh, so, oh, I skipped over one. I was, so uh, Matt Calhoun brought to our attention, Terra Grunt now has built-in support for OPA. Uh, so ter- you can ter- test. Did, what did I say? Teragrant. Ah, I meant yeah, you ter- said ter- test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ter- test, um, which is the uh, Go-based testing framework uh, for infrastructure in general, but specifically Terraform that we use for a lot of the testing here at Cloud Posse. So I guess they've added a uh, native OPA support to it. I haven't looked at the implementation specifically. Um, it's what it's basically just a, it's just a method call that you make on on the terror test to validate the um, to validate the your code against the policies and you you pass in the list of policies that you want to validate mm-hmm. it against. 
And uh, I don't know, I see it as pretty cool for like static validation for a lot of stuff that we try to do um, before merging things. So yeah. Um, and obviously org specific policy could be could be very easily uh, implemented in there. What I, um, so I mean, I understand tool consolidation, why that might be nice, especially if the company is already using TerraTest um, for this. What, is, what are the benefits? Like, uh, what are the technical implementation benefits you see over using this and something like ConfTest, which uh, we'll do similar? Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like, if you're already using TerraTest to, mm -hmm. to test your code, why not also, why not also, like, validate all your policies with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it makes, I don't know, it makes perfect sense to me um, to, to do that. I mean, comp test, I think you'd have to then use a separate tool if you weren't, you know, if you were using this to test mm -hmm. already, it would be a separate tool to do your policy tests. But I don't know. I thought it was a cool little addition. Yeah. Running this module, load manually, install HCL to JSON, I'm not sure. What is, is this actually part of the... That, that's if you if you manually want to like run the test that something's happening if you want to do it with OPA like mm -hmm. directly with the OPA like command mm -hmm. line path they're showing you how to run it there because right now OPA doesn't support um, parsing uh, parsing HCL directly so you actually have to mm -hmm. convert HCL to Terraform but like the the module like that you can actually call with Go. Um, does all that for you? Basically, it does the conversion and then calls the the OPA like path under underloaded for you. It'd be interesting to see what the, the do they have an example of what the violations look like? Are they accurate enough down to the line number? Yeah, there's uh, yeah. if you go look in the uh, up above in that code, look at the fail um, folder right there. Mm. That's like a failing. Uh, oh, sorry, you you actually mean like the output. Do they have any yeah, exactly. output what of that? The, yeah, yeah. No, I don't know. I don't know if they do or not. Interesting. Yeah. Anyone have something to add to that? So I don't remember when it was when Amazon announced uh, that you can have Dockerized Lambdas, but uh, that was met with much fanfare. I guess this is in response to Google's cloud run uh, to some degree. The downside though was that it only supported ECRs in the same account. And common pattern is to have a centralized or a number of centralized uh, container registries uh, for the purpose of uh, distributing artifacts. Well, this pattern didn't work with it. So when Amazon came out with their ability to have replicated ECRs, I thought, aha, they did this because that's gonna be their answer to the lambda, dockerized Lambda that you actually have to have multiple ECRs and replicate your ECR images between them. Well, it turns out that was my, my skepticism was uh, unmerited or unjustified because they actually came out with now cross account uh, ECR uh, sorry, cross account dockerized lambdas, or I'm saying this totally wrong, lambdas that support cross account uh, ECR image pulls. And that's that'll be nice for uh, our customers using Lambda. Yeah, not only that, but it also now enables someone to publish like official Lambda packages for like customer consumption and stuff like that for them. Like if you had an app that you want people to run on-prem in their own AWS account, you can now publish a golden image and give their AWS accounts like access to your ECR and then they can just run the official version. That nice, that's yeah. nice. That's a nice distribution model. Yeah. Hmm. And by Very the way, cool. we have added support for this feature to Lambda module. Okay, cool. That's the- uh, no, People already using it. That's, uh, I forget what it was called, uh, serverless.tf? Yeah. Cool. Related to this, I think that's really cool. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time at Cloud Posse having to deal with 
deploying vendorized vendors lambdas, uh, notably Datadog being one of them for uh, for forwarding um, CloudWatch log groups, for example. And it would be really great if uh, Datadog now and other vendors like them could just provide them these Dockerized images that we can then deploy the lambdas on our side. It'll be make the Terraform so much easier. And as Anton can probably attest to, like Terraform and pure Lambda, where you also have to build a Lambda artifacts is a messy, dirty business uh, involving a lot of developer tools locally. But if we're just using Lambdas with Docker images, that's a pretty elegant implementation all of a sudden. Yeah, and I can actually see that um, I think more and more people uh, use this uh, exactly uh, like they start building it uh, using simple uh, packaging scripts. Uh, which uh, works nicely uh, for some things, but then you figure out that, oh, you're putting too much logic on how you want to package all this stuff. And then it's quite natural for you to dump it into Docker file and build Docker image and yeah. consume these Docker yeah. images. But we have support for this as sub module and people are using it quite actively to build as well as uh, to, to deploy this packaged uh, artifact uh, or they can deploy it using code deploy. There are three sub modules inside of Lambda modules. Yeah, we use this uh, mm. exactly. Uh, module gotcha. is used exactly. This provider is used to build uh, image and push to ECR. So that yeah, that that makes sense to me. That would be a uh, I think that's a acceptable compromise using the Terraform provider to build the image and push the image to an ECR repository and then deploy it with Terraform. All, all in Terraform, all in native provider syntax, no local execs required, right? Yep. Nice. Yeah, the only, downside, I'm, I'm, the only downside with all of these buildings is uh, it's pretty hard to, uh, to make it to work on uh, Let's say Terraform Cloud, Terraform Enterprise. You need yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, that's true. And, uh, the and the I mean, other different oh. ways how this can be simplified for people, but it's well, it's pretty tricky because many different combinations. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say the other downside to to using Dockerized lambdas in this fashion is that um, they, they can get quite big. Um, and you're pulling a lot of data all over the place every time you launch a, a lambda, like so. Yeah, like, okay, you know, true, yeah. uh, so yeah. you know, depending on what you build, I think they up the limit now that a lambda Docker image can be up to ten gigs. Mm. Um, so if people were actually pushing that kind of uh, that kind of limitation, um, you know, you could you could be I could see this causing issues where you're pulling, you know terabytes of data, you know, yeah. over the course of a month, if you're, you know, from your central account to, yeah, you know, to yeah, your yeah, edge yeah. accounts. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. know if they cache it. You can infinitely scale cache. your Amazon bill. Yeah. So I don't know if they have a Docker cache, like in each region or whatever, but it would be interesting to see what happens if you, yeah. you know, they, if you had some auto scaling that way. Yeah. They have explained this uh, pretty a long time ago is that uh, they utilize uh, several layers of caching so that at the end, you, nobody is actually seeing this as Docker anymore. It is just mm. collection of files copied locally in one place, uh, cached on all possible levels, uh, mm. like edge region, um, I don't know what else, <laughs> like different kind of caches. So that's yeah, why- so They're using copying. Docker as a delivery, as a um, packaging or just uh, yeah. registry almost, but- how they actually run it is different. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, let's see, next announcement. This was also exciting, uh, especially for Matt, who spent like two, three weeks just implementing this support natively in Terraform, only for <laughs> that work to now be uh, total overkill and worthy of being thrown away. Uh, typical Terraform AWS fashion. So Matt, do you want to explain the problem we had and then why this is so exciting? Um, yeah, I mean, the problem isn't all that complex. It's basically that you 
if you're building your own custom AMIs, you need to, uh, prior to this announcement, you, you basically had to use Packer to copy that image every to every region and account that you um, that you intended to use that image in, um, and now it looks like uh, and also Amazon, set up the IAM permissions uh, to for the, for KMS keys. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not KMS sure. Keys. I'm not sure yet how that all factors into this. So if you mm -hmm. have an EBS encrypted volume with a KMS key, uh, I, I'm not sure how this new announcement handles. Um, you know, ha handles that. But now that KMS keys can also be shared, um, you know, cross region, um, and they could always be shared cross account previously. Um, it's, it would be interesting to use the combination of those two things to see if this, uh, this works. But of course, that's going to mean that, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to set it up to test it and, and figure all that out. But I think it's, um, I, the, the other thing with being able to share images with organizations and organizational units that's pretty cool is that you don't need to know the list of accounts and OUs that might exist um, in their destinations. And as you add more accounts to an organization or more OUs to an organization, they'll automatic, uh, automatically get access to, um, to those images as well, which is in in large organizations, they're often spinning up and spinning down accounts uh, pretty rapidly. So not to have to go back and re-grant permission to all of those things is also a pretty useful uh, function. Yeah, I look forward to that, especially if the spinning down of accounts was also easy. Well, that, <laughs> that, that I won't hold my breath for, but you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, we'll, we'll see. Maybe one of these days. Yeah, hopefully. All right, um, Matt Gowey and others uh, pointed out this uh, RFC from HashiCorp. Um, this addresses a problem near and dear to anybody who's been working with Terraform for more than a year, learned something along the way or two and realized, yeah, maybe we should refactor how we want our resources and our modules and all that. And that's never been. turned into a robot for a second. Also headphones. Yeah. Here we go. I'm back. Sorry. Uh, my other headset died here. So uh, where did I end up? So yeah, they pr pr present a simple proposal for how to do state migrations um, for Terraform. I, and I couldn't, I, I know I saw it here somewhere what that syntax would look like. I think if you click on those links that were in the top of that thing, I think they actually show you examples oh, okay. in there of how they it would look. Yeah, all right, there we go. Yeah, so uh, this top level uh, resource thing saying, uh, this resource here is now uh, moved over into here. A, a, an instance of a resource. Yeah. Even if you are using counts. So that, that sounds pretty cool to me. Um, I wonder how it'll work in practice. And I wonder how it'll work um, across a lot of environments if you're working with this or generations of environments or environments that maybe didn't start at the same point if i'm to think yeah. uh, so what, what, what i was reading through this a couple of days ago and basically they can chain off each other so hmm. say phase one you a became b and then now b became c you keep your a to b and you add a b to c Mm. And that way, if your customer is on an older version that's still on A, 
they can jump straight to C. Makes sense. That'd be cool. Like here, you're saying. Um, the, the fun part is when do you start cleaning up that chain? <laughs> <laughs> chain compaction. Yeah. And that's that's Ever. Uh, it's blockchain. If you, scroll, if you scroll to the bottom of one of these documents, uh, there is a note you yeah, like removing mo uh, moved blocks. And here it says uh, somewhere that like we are not recommending. We strongly recommend that you retain all historical moved blocks from early versions. Mm -hmm. this is I scary. see this. It's, it's, it's turning Terraform into an event sourcing platform. Basically, like, you know, you're just sending yeah, in all the changes cool. and you keep it forever. And then you calculate the current state from all the changes. Yeah. But I mean, is. Uh, if we think about how it's done in databases, it's similar. There'll be like a migrations uh, file somewhere. I guess the difference is this is uh, in the graph uh, and computed every time and not an explicit migration that would be run. Well, no, my computer. understanding was when this runs that those values actually move in the state file mm -hmm. if, they're, if they need to. Uh, it's more of, I guess, to keep the history of that is what mm -hmm. they're thinking. And so that you can go forever from one module to the late one, one from a really old version to a newest version. Yeah. Um, my opinion is eventually you make that breaking change saying, hey, anything older than version five must be upgraded to version four first before continuing. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, what about a uh, loop in all of this? If you change your mind and you decided to revert it. Then you move it back. <laughs> um, I don't, don't know how that works. <laughs> exactly. Well, and then my, my, my kind of a relevant question to this: uh, Has anyone been consulted when uh, this uh, thing was planned? Did any one of you uh, was kind of aware about these things uh, coming? But I mean, isn't that the purpose of the RFC and the, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I think that is them consulting now the community at large. Yeah, but there were three people involved overall from what I discovered. I mean, I discovered it a very long time uh, uh, in the process where everything was already written, almost mm. finalized. And uh, see, that's why yeah. last yeah. week uh, when I published this in weekly TF, I was like, Hey, uh, tell me if anyone from my uh, like uh, uh, closest uh, connection knew about this comment. Not yeah. like nobody knew about this, including most of you guys, as I can hear. Uh, yeah, yeah, I read. Yeah. I read about it a couple of months ago, like when the RFC was first published. I saw it, and they iterated on that a while, but I didn't actually participate in the the comments or um, or you know feedback or anything like that. I just kind of read it because I was busy. Yeah, and quite quite interestingly, there were two people who were developing similar tools already for uh, TF uh, Migrate, uh, and another one was uh, some sort of for Azure. I don't remember the name of the tool. So the developers of those tools were involved, and that's pretty much it. So I, I feel that uh, this feature was like developed. Uh, but uh, no real uh, use cases were actually discussed with people who are maintaining this stuff. I mean, we guys yeah. maintain Terraform modules and yeah. uh, we have to somehow think about what do we do with this? Uh, yeah. It, it, I mean, well, first of all, I'm really happy. I mean, I, there are two ways to interpret this. One thing is I'm glad that they're finally taking it seriously and have the proposal out because this is a problem that's affecting us and everyone doing modules like, we want to move the modules forward and we want to maintain backwards compatibility, but it's getting really hard. And we've had a pretty nonchalant attitude, to be honest, like, well, we, you know, we, we can't, we can't just maintain uh, forever backwards compatibility, but if this is now helping us do that, I'm happy. Now, is this the right interface? I don't have an opinion yet on it. To me, it seems to make sense. So uh, I, I'm, I, I don't mind not being, consulted, but <laughs> uh, I guess what I would love to see is if there's a way uh, to generate those automatically between any two versions, that would really make this uh, compelling. 
So you're looking more from a database migration perspective. Yeah. Right. Where we have generated migrations and then at some point we really clean them up and say like, okay, we forgot about past and now only rolling yeah. forward. Uh, this stuff is not exactly the same. Mm. Like, uh, yeah, well, it's not exactly the same. Uh, I, I granted that, but it conceptually it feels very similar. Uh, or, and uh, is there something you would like, is there something uh, missing here from your perspective um, in the implementation that you, or, so, or something you would like to see different? Yeah, one thing which I was uh, thinking is to have it a little bit less, uh, um, uh, less, um, I would say, like I, I wanted to have some sort of ID so that I can say that, okay, now I'm doing migration and I give it a name. So instead of being on yeah, this block, I agree. Like move, I would like to have moved and then some identificator so that I can tell. Some that would be so. That would be so consistent with how their other resources are. Like exactly. this should be moved in a name of the uh, like maybe an explanation or something meaningful internally to yeah. key it off of. I agree with that. Yeah. And, it, and another thing which uh, I know that they have also done in the upcoming release of one point one is where they do some of this um, migration actually under the hood, so to speak, so that if you didn't have count. Uh, on resource, and then you add count from zero to one, for example, mm -hmm. then uh, they somehow propose or somehow recommend and guess that, oh, you just uh, uh, try to keep the same resource, but it's going to be migrated. Mm. So we don't want to recreate it for you. Mm. So this kind of thing uh, is happening uh, in parallel to this change. Mm -hmm. But my biggest concern is that uh, what do I do with Terraform 030? Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> we still maintain a lot of stuff for that one. But, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I wish, I, I wish I, this stuff, and I think this, this can be actually possible to backport this functionality to uh, 013 without. I don't know. At, at this point, though, if they release 1.1, you're like, yeah. you know, whatever, five, yeah, exactly. five major I, releases back. So like, I, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's tremendously kind of you to be supporting all the way back to yeah. 0 0.13 um, at your own expense, by the way. Uh, exactly. But at some point, you got to make the executive decision as a community on like, yeah, you know, we, we gave you guys a year. At some point, you got to pull, pull off that Band-Aid. <laughs> it's funny, but we upgraded to 0 0.13 just... Uh... I think January or February this year. Oh, okay. I mean, this, we, we don't yeah. use all of these fancy, fancy features of Terraform since mm -hmm. that time. Sometimes code looks ugly, but it works and that's important. And another thing which I'm also not, not sure how will work is, is it possible to use dynamic uh, values inside of list, for example, here they, uh, or if you scroll a little bit up, uh, this, no, up, more up, well, no, no, probably, yeah, here, so here they have moved from module A to module A2, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what if I don't know, uh, instead of two, there should be some unique key, for example, yeah, like some, string, you, some string. I don't know exactly the value. I need to do some maybe data source lookup or some evaluation of some expression. I don't know. You know. In in, in, pra in in all practicality, this one seems very difficult to uh, like, almost never usable because I mean, usually the the count <laughs> count is unknown, right? <laughs> And it's yeah, exactly. coming from other data sources and like the, you know, whether you're growing or shrinking, it's like, yeah, that's not feasible yeah. to manage. Just yeah. in the context of this whole conversation, let me just say, please, everyone, make sure that if you're using this, that you have good backup of your state files. Yeah. <laughs> it scares the crap out of me. I know, like, as... S3, S3 with, with revision history, make sure that's turned on and or whatever you're using, but like double check or triple check before you try any of this. Yeah, agreed. 
that's a good uh, observation. Uh, there is a new product. I don't know what is it actually, but if you go to tfstate.cloud, uh, you will see what is it. Quite funny. It's like for people who are lazy to make their own S3 buckets, you can have HTTP backend for your Terraform state. <laughs> <sighs> if you sword, go to get in stored in someone else's cloud now that has all your <laughs> access to all your secrets yeah 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 yeah, yeah. in exchange for uh, us deploying a crypto miner you get a free state back in yeah let me let me sign up right now <laughs> am i doing a paste bin back in <laughs> it's actually a paste bin <laughs> your state yeah. is now public uh <laughs> <laughs> Pay us to make it private. Yeah, no, the, the, there's <laughs> been a, there's been secure. this and there's some other like um, upstart I saw for managing Terraform state uh, back in. I don't think it was this one. And it's funny. I, I appreciate the initiative and the, the gumption to do it, but like, who's going to trust their infrastructure to some small like weekend side project? Uh, so maybe it's on prem though, no? Or is it okay? It's well, no. This this one might be. This one might be. I don't know. But um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I would be very afraid to have tfstate.cloud. And uh, yeah, I assume if it's a cloud domain, then it must be SaaS. Yeah, yeah. But I'd be very scared to have that in terms of <laughs> trademark uh, uh, infringement. There, I think Terraform Cloud might have something to say about that one. Um, my point though was, uh, yeah, one of these, maybe not this one, but one of these, they were hosting your Terraform state for you. They were a Terraform state backend. They're, they just, they reverse engineered or hey, it's not reverse engineered. The, the format is now public and understood, under, well understood, but they, they were yet another Terraform state backend as a service uh, provider. Well, this uh, then, guys used just HTTP. So if, you, if you go on documentation, you will see exactly this. They might give you a built-in dashboard and some insight to your state. That would be a cool feature. Now it's not that useless. It's not a right. big enough uh, differentiator, yeah. It is HTTP, yeah. backend type HTTP. The, uh, yeah, the number of options now are pretty significant too. The GitLab, don't they even provide uh, Terraform state backend hosting now? as well. And uh, Terraform Clouds is free uh, for state backend hosting. So, all right, uh, let's move on to the next talking point. Um, that was the refactoring. Yeah, so as um, Anton or somebody else mentioned, uh, beta one has now dropped. We've been seeing the alphas on, you know, for the last, uh, what is it, six months or something. This means we're pretty darn close, probably to 1.1 coming out. Um, now, Ter or HashiCorp or Terraform rather has you know, said that all versions of 1.0.x will be compatible with each other and have no breaking changes. But this is going to be now the next test. Like, are we back to 0 0.12, 0 0.13 land now, 0 0.11, 0 0.12 land? How bad is this upgrade going to be between 1.0.x 1 1 and 1.1.x? Uh, has anyone been following this? I, I think that the community promise was that the language would not have breaking changes in future versions. Like that was their mm. their whole thing in any 1.x. So I hope that that's the case, but I don't know. This actually looks like if you read the, if you read the notes, very few of these things are like language changes. They're more, um, there are more features that they've added, like they added the move blocks and they've added some other changes to what happens when you run plan and apply and a bunch of other things. Yeah, this uh, specific thing which you're reading about uh, right now, something what has frightened me a bit uh, because uh, overall we have not seen so much um, kind of parts of Terraform Cloud inside of Terraform Core. And mm -hmm. uh, if you go to a change log, uh, like your previous tab, 
Yeah, so here they have a new cloud option in the Terraform setting block. Uh, that's mm -hmm. more native integration for Terraform cloud. Well, mm -hmm. I don't want to have. I mean, <laughs> Um, yeah, that's okay, but uh, I would rather have it pretty agnostic because this is, to my experience, the first time when they add something specific to Terraform Cloud. Yeah, a vendor extension. It happens that it's their own vendor, but um, yeah, when maybe it'd be more palatable if it was a generalized interface. So now, like we have providers, maybe you can have extensions and then cloud is an example of that extension. That'd be kind of interesting, but. Yeah, so there were different proposals for extensions, uh, like the one which you say, and also there was another one for backend providers. Because mm. I want to save it in, let's say in something my own, which is not supported. And there is no way to do that. But instead, they do something specific for Terraform Cloud, which is probably a bit bad for some other attackers. Do you know what this, uh, so did it say what the cloud block, what are the new parameters that it adds? Mm, I don't remember. I read about it, but it was uh, yeah, not so relevant for me because. Yeah. Not using Terraform Cloud so much, and I would rather not have something what works in one provider but doesn't work in another provider. I mean, not provider but uh, platform. All right. That was interesting. Uh, last last uh, thing in this uh, regards, if you scroll, uh, a new type function. Uh, I have no clue why they added it only inside of. Terraform console, <laughs> but uh, I'm really uh, missing this function uh, still. Even if I yeah. want to, say, I want to. I, sometimes I struggle between list and map, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I I had to write some ugly function just to make sure that I get what I want. It'd be com it'd be convenient, right, when you're working with any, and then you you know you exactly. could get uh, yeah yeah cool yeah. Oh, this is cool. Uh, this uh, has recently come up a couple of times from our customers. Without running Terraform Destroy, we will now allow deleting a workspace. But will it also delete the workspace files? Probably. Uh, not. It's worth checking well, that otherwise, out. Otherwise, what's the, what's the point of it? Yeah. If I just uh, delete it in one place, it's not enough. So yeah, delete files, I think. Can I add that to my notes to look into? All right, cool. Let's see what else, uh, anything else uh, to highlight, Anton, or anyone else from uh, the 1.1 announcements of Terraform? Not so much. Actually, nothing from uh, features which we wanted for the last four years this year. Yeah. OK, let's uh, jump to the next announcement. Last one is, um, oh, yeah. So uh, it's related to this one, which I skipped. Uh, so uh, Terraform, uh, the AWS provider, came out with bottle rocket uh, support already. Um, it's a specific uh, AMI type, which is why uh, a change to the provider was uh, required. And that has merged and we are now adding it to the EKS node group module. Um, we had some internal reviews going on this, so I don't think it's merged yet. And uh, yeah, we'll see. All right, uh, let's jump into a quick Q&A. We don't have that much time left. Um, any questions uh, we can cover today? Let's 
visiting the Slack channel here, office hours. Yeah, no questions? Come on, no questions? I didn't see your uh, comment there earlier, Jim. You were saying you're, I mean, trolling, but. Uh, it wasn't know, a real question. <laughs> uh, I know, I know, but it is, it is a good observation. I mean, like, you know. Lambdas have this uh, execution window, and if you're pulling 10 gig Lambdas, uh, yeah, <laughs> does that count towards your execution time? I'm guessing it does not, but. So from what I remember about a year ago when they announced it, I mean, all these 10 gigs, they tell that everything will be pre-warmed, copied, and everything will be very, very mm -hmm. fast, uh, literally laying on the very closest level of cache when you are about to call it. Okay. So 10 gig versus five kilobytes is the same. Oh, okay. As long as you're not uh, downloading 10 gigs uh, from S3, <laughs> for some reason. Yeah. yeah, that would impact it. Yeah. I have a this question. Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, Sharif asks, um, how do you suggest doing database snapshot dumps and restore from production dev and, uh, to uh, you know, dev and staging environments? Um, and it's a hot topic. Uh, it always comes up in our release engineering conversations with customers. Um, the, the issue is of course, do you have sensitive data or PII, PHI, cardholder data, CHD in your production uh, databases? The other is, you know, what is the size of that data? The other is, um, uh, you know, do, you, do you actually need to do that? Can you get away with fixtures? So in the ideal outcome, you can just get away with fixtures, but the problem with fixtures is you're not testing uh, a realistic data set to what you have in production. And the challenge of using what you have in production is leaking uh, PII and uh, you know, PHI and cardholder data. And obviously there are the, the ethical concerns of doing that, but then there are the practical concerns. I have been in companies where, you know, they have a uh, user list uh, that uh, makes its way into staging and accidentally like the newsletter goes out to all those email addresses because they're testing something. So you, you wanna have realistic data, but you don't wanna have real data where you can accidentally uh, communicate with yeah. customers. There was actually a tweet last week by uh, an AWS engineer that I follow who said that um, earlier in his career, he was testing something on a test system and accidentally sent every developer at AWS a thing telling them that their like, uh, that their developer, like one of their developer keys had expired and that they shouldn't use it anymore. And it wasn't true. Um, and he <laughs> had to go like send an apology email to like thousands of developers. So yeah. Um, you know, that, that seems pretty scary, so. <laughs> what was that, everyone remembers what happened, was it last year or how long ago it was in Hawaii, there was the emergency, uh, you know, warning that like, this is not a drill, it was, uh, you know, head for cover, something to that effect. Yeah, and they accidentally sent it out to everyone, so. Yeah. Yeah, it was there, 2018 already. <laughs> yeah. So there's also something to be said about like, you know, anonymizing the data um, as you copy it over. I mean, I, if you absolutely must have per, like very good quality, like production data in like staging, um, my, my suggestion would be is to build yourself some sort of ETL pipeline that extracts the data from production, um, scrubs it for, for any sort of PII uh, and anonymizes it um, so that, you know, so that you don't end up with any of those mistakes. <laughs> uh, and then, then you can schedule that job to run on a regular basis and make sure that you have, you know, production-like data in staging. Uh, you, can also, yeah. you can also use a feature of uh, AWS, which is database migration service, uh, which has possibility, I don't remember how exactly it can do this, but it has possibility to uh, 
mask something what uh, it identifies. Oh, DMS can do masking? Because that would yeah. be interesting. Yeah, just, I just uh, found a blog post about this exactly. I and that can... This. Yeah. And, and the benefit with that is then you can actually be streaming a journal from yeah. your production to staging and keep it relatively scale-wise up to date just with uh, anonymized data. So they have support for expression-based data transformation. Hmm. But now, uh, hey, Eric, we're, we're working on this right now ourselves, and there's a Postgres uh, RDA, a plugin um that will help that it doesn't run it's it, it actually does the scrubbing in a java uh extension on the server but apparently doesn't work with rds anymore so we're looking at you know, mm. pulling something in the prod account scrubbing it there pushing it to like a bucket in a global account or whatever and that'll work right for reasonably sized data sets. Oh, we got, you know, 50 gigs, 20 gigs, 10 gigs, 100 gigs. You have two terabytes, you know, you're probably not going to want to be ETLing that uh, on a regular basis or greater. Yeah, but my, my suggestion wasn't to do the entire the, the entire database every night. No. It's either take a subset or just take change sets like Presumably, yeah, you can you can tell when the last time you updated your database was. So give me everything that has mm -hmm. updated since la la yesterday, and, or last hour, or last fifteen minutes, or whatever, and then run your pipeline on it. Um, I've seen it done with some like extremely large databases that way um, that have hold healthcare data, and it it works fairly well. Yeah. Plus, we're looking at um, you know the schema we expect to change. We know it's going to change. Um, from customer to customer, day to day, and how people are feeling that day at times. So, you know, we're also working on on a strategy that's going to sort of abstract that level out. So, you know, we're going to be pushing the raw files in whatever standard format is appropriate to that version, and then we'll have some kind of conversion configuration. Uh, and we're looking for those tools, you know, to bring it to the global uh, uh, you know, data store definition, however that's gonna work. I don't know if this is, I don't think this is what I was thinking of, but I, I remember seeing something at some point, now this one's not been maintained and updated, but I remember seeing some official project that strive to help with this problem, but anyone uh, know? I know? I know you can use Athena to, for, for sure to, to anonymize data, it has like, Huh. It has a function to do that. Hmm. Hmm. So if this is like an offline job, we've got options like we could run it in a Kubernetes cluster, the data pipeline, EMR, I don't know. You know, it sounds like a database migration tool might be an option. You guys have any thoughts on, you know, on, on those approaches? Uh, all I could add would be going back to our conversation, was it last week or the week before we were talking about preview environments and what your use case is. So if the use case is to use these data sets with short-lived ephemeral environments that you want to come up quickly, then uh, yeah, look into containerizing that data set so you can just run it under Kubernetes and have it come up within a couple seconds or a second versus waiting on an RDS database to come online. Yeah, the, uh, the, the hierarchical namespaces gave us hope for, for uh, ephemeral environments. So I have to look more into it, but mm. much easier to spin those things up there. Yeah. All right, thanks. Sure thing. Um, a strategy I've used uh, for ElastiCache, but I know the APIs are similar for RDS in that you can export a snapshot because we have this thing staging in production accounts, is we take snapshots in production, export them to S3, and then restore into the staging account. And it's not trivial because like you essentially have to either, especially if you want to set up like a CloudWatch 
event to be sent across bus uh, the default bus to another account. It's somewhat involved and a, and a little bit convoluted and not, not typical, uh, but that is one approach that if you if you but then there's no account. scrubbing of the data right in that in that situation because oh, you're yeah, think step yeah that you want yeah to yeah. Yeah. yeah so and i think that's like two that that... in the account in in the prod account before it leaves well or at least in transit somewhere in the trans yeah, uh, in the transpose uh step however that happens i mean yeah. you uh, you could simplify some of this um in a kind of you know scouts honor way where you do do this rds snapshot you restore the snapshot and staging and then you kick off a process to clean it up and there's a window where you could leak some information uh, it's not ideal but you know, complexity wise that would be simpler possible yeah, I think for we have compliance restrictions that wouldn't allow that. Yeah, I was gonna say in yeah. in, in HIPAA, particularly in HIPAA, that would be uh, that would be illegal. Either that, or yeah. you you would end up getting you would opt in your staging environment to be uh, Under, to be a covered yeah. account basically at that point. <laughs> yeah, like I, I've been I've been sort of talking about this for a while here, and found out that somebody was working on it, and that's the, that developer where I'm like, you got to watch him. And he's telling me, about, he's like, yeah, I found this code. It's great. So I just downloaded the data to my desktop and I'm running. And I'm like, you're downloading prod data to your desktop. Like, I told you people to talk to me about this, you know. Uh, but now the visibility of this has been raised. And we hired a really good uh, data engineer. So we're looking at getting this in order and doing it properly. We, you know, also for uh, forensics, you know, you want to look at what's going on in a prod issue, you need that and you need, you know, a snapshot, which is a whole separate path of data from, you know, your scrubs, dumps, mm -hmm. data sets, you know. Yeah. So, while well, the only solution here I see is that you restore a snapshot in production, you sanitize it, and then you are transfer it in anywhere. But the alternative way, is to make sure that uh, you, you actually have as much metadata and non-compliant uh, data in the other database, in the other account. And you only actually store like a key, we don't have a key value store, which refers like, which stores in aliases in the compliant environment. So then all the amount of data and, and uh, complexity goes into the compliant environment. and the uh, compliant remains only key value. Yeah, and, uh, that's a good I was, and, uh, and I was previously working in a startup which does this, which does a SaaS for this called Rig Security. So which they actually do is host this key value for you and make you compliant because you store all the sensitive data in their key value. So, but you can also do this on-prem on, on your own. And there's also startups which do this for you on-prem uh, on your own too. Um, like uh, I don't recall the name actually, but you, you can Google. So it's like an, it's an emerging uh, uh, market right now, and people just making their their life easier by this by moving the complexity out of the compliance accounts. Well, thanks, Matt, Max. I think that was an interesting uh, suggestion there on like don't like we've talked about all these other technical problems what in your suggestion is a little bit like let's reduce the technical complexity by simplifying the schema if you have yeah. the option to, to, and, token yeah. x uh, token x is the pass okay. is on, on prem and uh, very good security is so, so and i think there is more so just try, try to see so with that i want to just uh, say we were over time for today this has been a really interesting conversation got a lot out of it thanks everyone for participating if you haven't yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, head over to youtube.com slash C slash cloud posse, and you'll get this episode and outtakes from our past episodes as well. If you haven't already uh, subscribed uh, to receive the office hours uh, invitations, our weekly uh, calls, head over to cloudposse.com slash office hours where you can subscribe to get those. We also have our Slack community at slack.cloudposse.com and uh, look forward to connecting with all of you on LinkedIn. Head over to linkedin.com slash in slash Osterman and see you there. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.